Thank you, uh, Ryan, uh, for this really uh, gracious introduction. Uh, and good evening uh, to all of you. It's great to see you in such numbers, uh, close friends, family, and a lot of familiar faces. It gives me great pleasure to do what I like to do. Usually, we like to banter and we like to chat and joke around. We talk a lot about wildlife, incidentally. But that just has, happens as an incident to lots of the other chapter that goes about. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. We're just going to be having a conversation. And we're going to let people come in at various stages. But I love the point uh, Father Rhino brought up. What has the Xavier's Center for Historical Research got to do with snakes? Okay, so it takes me back to a point of time, I think it was uh, around the year 1997. We were around our 12th standard. I was with my very close friend Solano. He's sitting at the back over there. Uh, and we were walking back from this auto Polvary sporting club. We were going back home. And in those days, no lights. It was about 7 o'clock. We had just about crossed the 7 o'clock you know, time mark when we had to be home. And um, it was, you just have these kind of intermittent street lights. Some of them were on, some of them were off. But I always loved snakes. I was completely fascinated by them. And um, I saw a snake cross the road. It was kind of very, it was dusky, uh, but it was dark. So I had this table tennis racket in my hand. I don't know if you remember, but it was in a white bag, uh, in a white table tennis bag. And I touched the snake and it made a loud you know, so it was a really loud sound. And that snake was something called the Sauce Viper. In company, you call it the Fushek. How many of you have heard of the Fushek? Please raise your hands. Fushek, actually, yeah? So it's interesting that only a few of you all put up your hands. So you'll say, okay, many people haven't heard of the Fushek. But the Fushek constitutes one of the snakes that is the snake most commonly responsible for snake bites. They're the big four. Can any of you name what the big four are? Yeah, please. The Russell Viper, Common Pig, Sauskill Viper, and Nicky Cobra. Okay, Nick, what's your name? Bob. Bob, thanks so much. Yeah, so it's a Russell Viper, Common uh, the, the, the Pig, Sauskill Viper, and the Cobra. They're the big four. So if you get bitten by a venom snake, you don't really have to identify it. You can literally go to the hospital because the chance of you getting bitten by one of these is very, very high. Okay, so you could just literally go back into the hospital. Uh, they, they will do a clocking test and you will be administered antibiotics according to that. Now, why I'm, why I'm talking about the Xavier's Historical Research Center, the Lactrack Plateau, what does it have to do with, uh, what does it have to do with snakes in my conversation with Rao today? So these Lactrack Plateaus are extremely unique habitats. They are hot, dry habitats and Lactrack is you know, Chire, what you used to construct your homes in Goa, Lactrite is Chire. It's basically weathered basaltic rock that has kind of come down, it's melted. So if you look at it, it actually looks like a bubbling choco lava cake. If you go to Baker Street, you find the choco lava cakes. They look just like Lactrite, in a way. And when you put it in the sun for extended periods of time, it hardens, it becomes really hard. Okay, so if you just have this kind of molten mass, it's really beautiful. But if you put a chisel or a pickaxe and you hit it, okay, it's got this metallic thing, number one. And number two, it's got a reddish color underneath it. And the reddish is because of the presence of iron oxide. Now, again, why am I talking about labyrinth plateaus? Labyrinth plateaus extend all the way from Mumbai, going right down to Trivandrum. They're distant hills. They're small little hillocks with these, with these flat lands. So the Western Ghats extend all the way from Gujarat, the Dhamas, right down to Kanyakumari, which is the Dalakat Mughalzurai Tiger Reserve. Huge. And you have that right plateau from the Western Ghats. They're contiguous. 1,600 kilometers of, of length. The land right plateaus are kind of in between the Western Ghats and the coast. But very interestingly now, if Solano suddenly pops in and I ask him, where is the most amount of development happening in Goa? It is on these land right plateaus. Almost all the lateral plateaus in Goa are perfect for construction. This place I was standing at, I would turn over various stones. I'm very pleased to see various friends of helping me pick up these stones on these plateaus. Barry sitting at the back, Solano, 
there is there's a few of you all over here. Because under every stone at one point of time, we had to say this historical research center was a saucy and white world. They were very extremely, extremely common. They were everywhere. When we got uh, calls in the house, we could occasionally get the software by far. It wasn't so common, but they were everywhere. Now, the reason I'm, I'm coming to all this is because if you go out today, somebody over here was talking about how much of development is happening. And I just thought of it, this radius, and, and father like, actually struck the thing of why I need to talk about this. This area has gone through so much of conversion, not just in terms of the concrete jungle, but there's actually a forest coming up. And it's very interesting that the forest coming up is because of the digging that's happened, mud is accumulated, you have trees. Now, unfortunately, the saucepan wiper does not like trees. It does not like shade. It wants hot, lamplight plateau, where there are various other herbs, prostrate herbs that thrive there. They are thorny plants, like a tsumna, khanta, etc. They love this kind of hot area. They thrive in these areas. Okay? So, it's, it's really important to understand that this Phase shift is not necessarily killed off everything. In fact, this area, you still have a large number of snake calls, Russell Vipers, Cobras, etc. We never had that many before. You're getting calls now. So, for everything, the point I'm trying to make for everything that we lose, there is a trade off. We gain some, we lose some. The point is, what do we really want to lose and what do we see that we should be gaining? And with that, I'd like to come over my close friend Rahul. We know each other for the last three decades. We've traveled to several parts of the country. We've gone unreserved uh, to Odisha at a time in, back in 1997, right? And this was a time when you know you would rarely send your firstborn born male child alone on an unreserved coach all the way to Odisha. No cell phones. And no cell phones, yeah. No and phones. Yeah, exactly. So we went we went that way that it, it was accompanied by a lot of adventures, but as I said, there's a lot of other banter that we've enjoyed kind of engaging with over the years. And I'm gonna come and I'm gonna come straight to Rahul now. So Rahul, my first my first big question to you, before I go into anything else, is you've been kind of working rescuing snakes for the last over two and a half decades now. You know, many of us have been doing it, but you've been doing it in a very concerted manner. You've been going house calls, uh, doing a whole lot of things. My first question is, have you seen a change in the number of snakes, number one? Have you seen a change in the species caught? You know, and what is your and, and what is your kind of impression of this period of time, of two and a half decades? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I haven't done that much rescue work in the last 10 odd years. But during the time that I was rescuing snakes, it was, it was 10 species that made up 90% of the snakes you would find. So uh, you had the cobra, you had the, uh, the Russell's viper. Crates were kind of rare. I almost never found a source here in Whitehall, which it just shows you the difference in our experiences because we went looking for snakes and I was going and picking up snakes that brought into people's houses. So I never had a source here. In, in 15 years of snake rescue, one source here in Whitehall. That's it. But uh, among the non venomous snakes, uh, rat snakes, wolf snakes, uh, checker keelbacks, Bronze back, tree snakes, uh, little cobots, I mean, and uh, rock parties. I think that makes about 10. So that is basically what I saw. I want to point out one thing. That is no reflection of what snakes are, what kind of snakes are actually around people's houses. And that's because um, you know, I, I found a lot of cobras, and I believe it was because people were scared to kill cobras. Either because they were frightened of them, or because of, they were terrified of the consequences. So I found a, a lot of venomous snakes, but I believe what was happening was a lot of the non venomous ones were just getting smashed, you know. And um, at some point, actually, I, I got quite disillusioned with the snake rescue. Um, because 
you know, uh, people were happy to to listen to when I was explaining that this is a rat snake and it's not venomous. But I felt they were just serenading me because the next time there was a rat snake, they just killed it. If I wasn't able to go there, and I didn't want to be treated like pest control. That was not the point. I didn't want to take away an imagined problem for people. I just take the snake, put it somewhere else, and have I actually made a difference? You know, that's basically my experience with snake rescue. Yeah, I think I think you 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 kind of make a really important point. Um, I think as, as snake handlers and people who have worked in this field, particularly if you like snakes, there's almost a natural itch to, to grab a snake, even though you don't recommend it to others. It's like almost an innate itch that you have to, to reach out or stop your car, to use your wife's bag when you don't have anything else to place the snake in it. You, as a snake handler, you would you want to catch a snake. And I don't know if you share this particular kind of fascination. Absolutely. For me, actually, my experience, because, you know, uh, when we got chatting and uh, when we got in our teens and we were discussing how uh, we got to learning how to handle snakes, actually, uh, I consider Adam's story much more adventurous because when he was nine years old, if I remember correctly, he just went out and picked up a snake by the tail and brought it home. And it was a crate. Yeah? And I loved snakes. I always wanted to um, handle snakes, but I didn't know how. Yeah, and I, I, I was, I was always, uh, my neighbors had put up enough stories about snakes, you know, about how they go in your gills, and they eat up your brains, and this will happen, and that will happen. So my real learning came when I took that year off, and I went to the Puma Snake Park, and I went to the Madras Crocodile Bank, and I actually, in that way, got training, you know, to handle snakes. But yours was completely different, yeah? So for me, the whole, uh, when I got back to Goa, how do you find a snake? Have you ever considered, I mean, most people don't want to find a snake, yeah? And the person who is most terrified of snakes, Morphe's law, that's the person who finds the snake first. Yeah. They don't want this. I often tell people, oh, don't worry, in Goa, you are happy to find a snake, maybe twice in the... They're here in Goa five minutes and they've already found the snake. But for someone like me, very difficult to find a snake. So the best way to the world out there, you're a snake rescuer. Now you have thousands of eyes, thousands of pairs of eyes all over Goa looking for snakes for you. That's the way I saw it. You know? And that was my access. And over, over a period of uh, like 15 years or so, I must have rescued around 2,000 snakes, which actually is not a big number. I, I, I have colleagues like Simon and who probably rescued like 15,000 snakes. I mean, I don't know whether they're rescuing the same snakes over and over again. <laughs> but that was the way we got. So my interest in snakes entirely selfish, right at the start. But of course, you know, you go to a, a person, sometimes you end up in a house and you see a snake smash. What do you do? What, what do you say to that person? And there's this, this kind of, uh, you know, this car that people do not display. I was scared, I didn't know, so we killed it, you know. And uh, this is another thing I want to tell you guys, by the way. Say you love horses, okay? And you really study horses and uh, you know the different breeds and you're really interested in them. And then I keep sending you pictures of dead, mangled horses. One horse that's smashed on the head, another one that's run over by a car. And I ask you, what breed is it? After it's smashed. And this is what I'm getting. People are just interested in knowing something. They're sending me dead snakes, photographs. What's the use? What am I supposed to do with that? And then I, and they want to know, so, so usually I just currently give the name of the same, and immediately, while I can see the person typing, I'm already writing Ron Venice, or Venice, whichever it is. And that, that's where it ends. But nothing is really changing for the same. You know? It's all person-centric. You have this information, you say, ah, I know it's a Ron Venice snake now. Or, oh, it's a Venice snake. But what do you do with that? I think, I think uh, 
he makes some really important points. And one of the things that comes up quite clearly is that actually the number of snake rescuers, when I talk to you know, people catching snakes, in fact, at one point of time, we moved, there wasn't very many of us. There was this group that Rao's dad got from years ago, it was called the Nag Association. Remember that, Rao? We had a meeting in, um, in Panchum just below Guru Vasco. It was the first meeting back in 96. I remember we sat together, there were like about five or six of us. Obviously, one guy was completely like, you know, he's got written like price on his fingers and he was telling stories about how he survived that. His mouth was full of gold teeth. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. And he, uh, he had one bent finger and all that. So it was, it, it was at that point of time, you come today, and there's probably a snake rescuer in every village in Goa. You know, it's quite a big, it's quite a big network. But what is interesting is that the number of snake calls are really very high. And they're particularly very high for things like Russell's wipers, cobras, the two main commonly caught species. Now, one of the, one of the big questions I ask is, these snakes have possibly increased in abundance. They're doing well in human habitations. A lot of people actually believe that, oh, you know, they're cutting the forest here, that's why the snakes are coming to the house. No, the snakes are coming to the house because they're thriving because of you. Bidens are important in the city of Panjim, in trains, etc. My, my, my question to you, Rahul, do you think this rescuing should continue for posterity? Or do you think we have to kind of change what we say to the people, that really you need to be living with these snakes rather than us rescuing them because we never really rescue it. They are generally just chucking over the person's gate. I mean, if you just want to know. Yeah, I, I, I stopped rescue work because of that. Uh, well, first of all, you know, as you were saying, when we first started rescuing snakes, there were like four and a half of us doing this work. And at that point, it was also very easy for people to, you know, sometimes it's 10, 30 in the night, you're exhausted and somebody calls you up. Um, it's kind of like a bit like a doctor's job. You know? there's, there's no end to it. You know, two in the morning is the fact somebody would show up at your house. Back in, in the day, you didn't have cell phones. You have to go. It's not a broken tap. It won't wait. You know? uh, so, in those days, uh, people would also play this game card. They would be like, uh, if you don't come, we're just going to kill it. Emotional blackmail. Now, um, no, or they would swear at you. They would like, uh, you, you would go to their house and say like, what are you animal rescuers? You know, we call you, you are not your, you are really love animals, so it's all, it's all bullshit. I would be like, you I know, have all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, so basically, yeah, what are you saying about that? No, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just listening to, like, uh, my, my question was, what is, uh, do you think the rescues, the rescue work, should go on for posterity? Because there's two reasons for that. One thing is snakes are a thriving in occupation. The second thing, there are lots of other bigger problems. Like, so I don't know if you come next week, he's going to be talking about large scale land use change. You know, we are losing huge amounts of these labyrinth plateaus. Okay, we've lost. Okay, there are, there are forests being converted to cattle plantations. There are other mangrove areas being converted to fields. There are mangrove areas being lost. Now each of these habitats, so we talk about mangrove habitats, you have two species that exclusively live in mangroves. The dog face spot snake and the glossy mark snake. One of them exclusively feeds on crabs, and that took crabs that have molded their exoskeleton, soft crabs. Those snakes are going to go. You know, other snakes will, are likely to come in there. What is it that we want to lose? Against all that, do we need to keep rescuing snakes, or do we need a paradigm shift the way we do conservation, if conservation is our goal. So the question I'm going to ask you actually, which is a rhetorical question, is, is there a snake situation in Goa? I mean, when you think about it, like, if, if the solution is always going to be, say in a house, we're going to find a rescuer, I mean, I see the entire snake rescuer thing as a, as a kind of a temporary transition uh, that should happen, you know, like where people are able to, um, that a snake rescuer comes over and he talks to you and he handles a snake, it should change something in you that you don't need it to that extent in the future. 
I understand nobody sees a snake, you know, and I, uh, this is the first time you've seen a snake, they're completely freaked out. But it has to change, otherwise there's always going to be snakes, snake rescuers, and people. It's, and there, it's always going to be conflict. There's always going to be, because what happens when you don't have the snake rescuer? What do you do, you know? Um, I want people to think that when you have a snake around your house, you have to consider snake on whether it's a snake in the air conditioner or a living room. This is a snake that's been living there for months. This is the first time you're seeing it. Yeah? But it's been living there for months, if not years. It's not been a problem. It's going, it, it, it negotiates its way around you. This is the first time you're seeing it, and suddenly it's become a problem. In fact, if you see a snake, I would go so far as to say, if you see a snake, you're absolutely safe. Because the only way you really get bitten, I and mean, the only way you really get bitten by a snake, is when you step on it. Unless you're a snake handler like him or me, where you're actually going to actively go and pick it up. Because nobody in his right mind sees a snake and that's the second like try putting my foot on it. It doesn't work like that. So when you see the snake, so I tell people, it's the snake you're not seeing. That's the one that you really need to be concerned about. And this is very important because if, if you stand a chance of getting bitten, the way it's going to happen is if you, you know, people don't think that the, there is a fear of snakes and there's the actual danger. And what's the fear of snakes is when you see the snake. You freak out. Yeah. But there's no danger. Because you see, the danger is when you take something for granted. Like you get out of your house and you walk to your garage. And the area is clear. But there's no light in the night. And you assume it's clear. Now if there's a Russell's wife going to a bar and you're walking towards it, you may assume that the snake hears you and moves out of the way. It's partially true, they hear you, but it will not move out of the way because it's camouflage. The way camouflage works is don't move, and you step on it, and that's the danger. So if people are not considering this, then what is the rescue about? I, I, I don't like, I don't like the, the point that you spoke about the tape part. Because if you, if you spoke to your parents, your grandparents, they say like, you know, Baba, don't go out there in the grass, so don't get out in the night, you'll get bitten. There are snakes in the grass. The snakes don't like grass because it's very difficult for them to hunt there. They prefer roads, paved areas. I don't know, my cousin Brendan is around here. Okay, he's not there. Okay, I've got other, uh, other cousins there. But, uh, Brendan keeps calling me every now and then. He's got this, he's got a house and it's completely paved around. But he said, Adam, there is, uh, there is a snake here, I think it's a Russell's wiper. And it's true, it's a Russell's wiper. For them, these paved areas facilitate their hunt. They'll either kind of sit directly under a lamp, because they attract frogs or whatever, but the lamp attracts frogs because they're coming for the insects or something of that sort. Snakes love paths. If you walk in on these pie parks, you know, these little foot paths in the casual plantations, you have Russell's wipers actually facing their heads into the park. Because when the cashews or other fruits drop, the, the cocoa and stuff drop, you have squirrels coming to eat them, small mice that these Russell wipers grab. So they're very often under the leaves, just with their heads sticking out. But, but, but the point you make is really important, you know. We need to kind of move out of the snake rescue mode, more into kind of, I think, I think the rescue helps because you're actually establishing the connection. It may not really change behavior today, but it's a long-term thing. A lot of people know a lot more than they did. But in the, in, the, in the backdrop of all this, you know, are we really saving the right snakes, or are we saving the snakes that are possibly as abundant as rats, then if they die, it wouldn't really matter. If I, I'm trying to be a bit provocative here, and even for me, the zombie snakes are actually pretty high densities, you know, like pythons like never before we've seen, and they're catching in people's houses now. I don't rescue so many, but I can tell you about people who are finding pythons in Donapola, in Miramar, in Singapore City, who have reticulated pythons, in the oil palm plantations of uh, Sabah, Sarabak, you have key cobras like you've never seen before. You don't have those densities in the forest because the prey abundance is not that high. We are facilitating some species of snakes, 
with main species of snakes like the Malabar pit vipers, the hump pit vipers, the coral snakes, the shield tails, they, they rely on these very niche microclimatic conditions that are totally changing. They are losing those, and those are highly endemic. If you lose them, you lost them forever. These are gregarious, you find them everywhere. The Sosuke wipe, which we thought is relatively resilient, it's a big four. They are going to have to kind of slowly move to calling them the big three. You have that in Goa University and Sukhoi, but like, there are a lot of, there's a lot of interest now. You know, people want to photograph stuff and they think photo documentation is going to make a change to conservation. That brings me to my next question, Rahul. Your book is full of great pictures, okay, with the stories that go by. But my point... You heard that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, thank you. I, yeah, it's, it's not always my cheap, but uh, your, your, your book is full of great pictures. But I know what it takes to photograph a snake, man. You know, you've got to, with a, with a venomous snake, you really have got to stabilize it. My cousin Kenneth sitting in the back had to do a whole bunch of things. He had to dance, uh, he had to dance in front of a cobra so that I could get the back out of the hood. Obviously, this happened maybe 20 years ago. I didn't do all that now, there was a lot more. Um, craziness that we did at that point of time, but the point was uh, we do a lot of stuff to, most of the snakes are in a defensive posture, they're going through a lot of stress. Very often we do all kinds of things. We talk to a herpetologist, they hold a frog, they swing it around a couple of times till it's days, they put it there, they photograph it. You have some people who put snakes in the fridge because it lowers their body temperature and then photograph it. You'll go to any lens, but then the, the kind of the broad message they're giving is we are taking pictures because we are going to educate you about snakes, their habitat and the suffering that they're going through. Do you think conservation photography as we are doing nowadays is really the solution? I know you've written a book, there's a lot of stuff and you needed those pictures to tell a story. But do you think conservation photography... First of all, I think I have been set up in some ways. <laughs> Uh, okay, the short answer, and in fact, I, I know what you're saying, and I'll give you the short answer if I had to lose this book and reshoot it. Maybe I wouldn't. Yeah. I, uh, you, you do have to, when you're photographing a snake, and when you're photographing birds, there's no controversy. The bird sits wherever it wants to. You will. You will. Fish out your camera, by the time you're taking your camera out, the bird's gone. You know, you try that about 15, 20 times, you may get a shot. Uh, with the snake, you control the environment because apart from uh, the white snakes and the Malabar pit vipers, everything else, uh, with all of the other snakes, they were either they were rescued snakes that were photographed before they were released. Yeah. And, to get a snake to look natural in a photograph, you do have to fiddle with it and try to get it to coil. And we've got some snakes that are like very photogenic, like Russell's vipers. They just, you know, you can often get them very easily to curl up and put coin. And what do you do with a rat snake that won't stop moving? And you need to get that picture, you need to focus on the head. So the point is, uh, I, mean, if I had different kinds of tricks. I would try to cover the snake, and then suddenly you, you, you take the cover off and you get a photograph. You, uh, it helps if you have a very uh, cooperative girl, a very enthusiastic girlfriend, uh, uh, my partner, Serena. But really, that's the process. Yeah. And while you're doing it, you're, you have to ask, how much of, how much are you going to make a snake endure for this? Yeah. Uh, how long? And this is a personal thing, and I, I, I feel I can answer this one now, that if I'm photographing a snake, I should be comfortable photographing the snake, even if you guys are around. Because at some point, somebody's going to say, That's, I think you should let it go. You know? And if you're on your own, or if you're with your buddies, and this is what often happens, we've, we've seen this. Uh, you're out at Amboli, there are five guys, they all want to get that shot. Everybody wants to get it, everybody wants to get the tongue out. And you're Just like that, with your own hand. So, can you throw some light on this? What exactly is this? 
uh, you know, uh, different strike handlers would have different things that they would do. Uh, there used to be a guy who would whistle, and he claimed that with his whistling, he would be able to bring the snakes out. Which is, uh, which sounds even more preposterous when you consider that snakes don't pick any animal vibrations, they can't hear. We seem to work around people, you know, it never worked when I was there because he had used to whistle. So it's a kind of a, it's like when one magician is sitting with another magician. I mean, how many of those tricks is he going to, like, actually play with, right? So that's the only thing I can think of. Because I can't discount what he's, what he's doing, but it's only if I actually privy to it, if I actually see it, and if I can, in some scientific way, uh, say yes, it works or no, I would just leave it at that. What do you think, man? Yeah. I, I, uh, just to back to Mark's three very short, I mean, people use all kinds of things to drive snakes out of bar sometimes like harmful smokes. I'm not really sure what it, what it does, but it could. Like, you, you, you use the term um, SOH, and I, I've seen that as well. The snake becomes really weak and, you know, whatever else in the, in the past, but, you know, there is, you don't really know what that person is using, and it could be actually harmful, and I think you should not be using it. Any of that is uh, the answer we would like to give on that front. Uh, I'd like to take a question in the back. This lady has been uh, having her hand raised for a bit. Uh, sorry, Fred. If you have a snake in the house, 
Uh, let's just consider maybe Coca, Russell and Swiper would be the trickiest, really. Yeah. Uh, you need to recognize snakes as separate species rather than classify them into venomous and non venomous So if you can recognize these 10 snakes that I talked about to begin with, then when you see it, you already know, okay, that's a bronze back tree snake and that's a cool thing, you know? And if it's a rat snake, I mean, my girlfriend is routinely trying to release rat snakes to the roof to deal with the rats and they never stick around, you know, because the roof is never cool enough. So, this is the thing. So if you can start to recognize snakes, then it will be automatic that when you see them, you will say, I don't need anyone coming for this, and I'm just going to enjoy this moment. You know, and if it's a really tricky situation, you may call someone, but you can always take a step further, and you could, you could think, how's a snake got in, and how am I going to get it out? And a thing like a snake handler, you just, if it's in one particular room, you shut the doors through that door, except the door going out. And if you've got a long stick, it's not that complicated. You slowly, you know, just touch it and kind of gently nudge it out. You know, the snake is going to hiss, maybe it's going to lunge. But honestly, if you're more than four feet from the snake and you're gently touching it, you may get a heart attack, you may scare the Jesus out of you, but you're not going to get it. I, I, I sense that you are going to say something that should be done? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, no. I think that makes sense. I just want to add uh, to what you say. So there's this, uh, there's this place, whenever I come from Goa, I like to go out in the morning for a patal party and some dish cheese because I go to this Kalpana cafe. So this uh, owner was actually my classmate, his name is Ashu. So he keeps giving me these false calls, you know, because he's working out of the gym or something like that. And he'd say, I don't know, I'll please go there, these fellows are out here, telling you the snake. And inevitably, there's never a snake there, you know, because snakes, they've seen it before, they've seen something that looked like a snake tail, and it goes out. So, like I was saying, please first make sure the snake is in your house. The second thing is, uh, make sure you can try and identify it. Or, or send them, or send them even if you want to pass it, that's good enough. Uh, I'd like to be, unfortunately, we are completely running out of time, but I would love to take a question for just one person over here, that's Blasio, who's sitting right in front. Fred, I'm really sorry, you're going to have to take uh, the picture because uh, he's also been um, having his hand up. Blasio's here. Hi, And spiders and things like that. 
The second one is a collection of the most interesting snake rescue experiences in Goa. You know, the, the funny part is it's not just it's not the snakes, it's really the way people behave around the snake when, when they come over and they don't even use the word snake and say Tunzo Soyola, which means your relative has come to my house. This is always known to the office. They didn't want to use the word snake because only one is in the house, they don't need to invite more. Yeah. So that was the whole idea was uh, was all the snake rescue experiences. The third one was just photographs uh, that I put in, in Heinz Liner's uh, third book. And uh, this one is is basically uh, photographs and and my uh, some information about snakes, whatever I feel is relevant. Uh, because I have not used very scientific information like the third supralabial scale which goes from the eye to the nostril is, is spiked or whatever. I, I, I put it the way I feel would be really the easiest way to identify snakes, you know, and also a little bit a little about their behaviors. So that's basically the, the whole program. I'm very happy to put this on great. So if you haven't bought it, I mean it's your loss. So, um, yeah, I think we've had a great session. We've enjoyed doing this ourselves. I hope you all have enjoyed it as much. And you have been a great audience. Thank you so much. And we are happy to take further questions outside. I'm sure I'll be meeting some of you outside as well. So, yeah, all the best. And I hope you'll enjoy the snakes in your surrounding. Accept them in your surroundings. They're very much part of it. But also look at them as big changes that are happening around us. Do remember that snakes, like many other species, whatever your species is, are really a lens to your broader environment. Keep that in mind. And thank you so much. And thank you, Rahul. Uh, yeah, for not throwing any more insults. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, on behalf of the Zavis Center of Historical Research, please give a round of applause for Raul Mahmoudis and Adam Rowe for having an excellent our conversation. And I think we have to do further more justice to buy Raul's book, and I think it's very important, I'm sure the book is on sale, to tell this story, you know, you know it's not to necessarily to identify venomous and non venomous snakes, good and bad people. Okay, yes. Uh, I think, uh, thank you, Raul, and thank you, Alan. I think this has been very informative. Uh, I myself am modified by snakes, if I see I get I think this will give a different thought. So, thank you. So, thank you, uh, Alan, and I'm sure Raul has done a fantastic job. Please give him a round of applause. I would like to thank the XCH staff, the director, Father Rangel, and all of those, all of, uh, of those who have put in the hard work to organize this XCHR conversation, especially get some brothers from Belgium. Thank you very much. We have announcements to make. Next week is going to be an uh, eventful week on April 19th, where the history year. We have Sonam over here, so he's going to be our resource person. This is on the Great Goa Land Grab. Please. Do come for this at 6 p.m. on April 19th. Mark your diaries on Friday. Also, we have an XCHR conversations. 2nd of May, we have also here Jaira Souza of Sydney behind, our resource person for the day, will discuss his book on crimes of passion. Once again, thank you very much, and I'm sure you can further take this conversation with Raul and Ellen. They are here with you, you can speak to them. I'm sure. Please buy it out. Thank you and have a good night.